I want you to go with me this morning to the book of Isaiah chapter 55. My text is taken from verse number 6. I'm using the King James translation of the Bible. I started this this morning on the subject of seeking the Lord. In our church, it is our month of seeking the Lord. Now, verse 6 of Isaiah 55 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and anoint the preaching and all teaching thereof to the praise and glory of Christ's name. Everyone say amen. I don't know about a lot of Christians, but for me, this is one of those perplexing scriptures. Because the scriptures seem to suggest that the Lord is not found all the time. Because why do you say why he may be found? Again, the scripture also said, call upon him while he's near. That scripture is seeming to suggest that the Lord is not always near. Now, that is fearful. Because the question would be, how am I to know when he can be found? I don't know if anybody's thinking in the way I'm thinking. How am I to know when he's near? The God we are talking about is a spirit. Which means he is not perceptible to the physical senses. My optical eyes cannot see him. And now the Bible is presenting a God that is already invisible in a way that is almost illusional. Why he may be found. Are there times that God may not be found? Call upon him while he's near. Are there times that he is far? While we struggle with the answer to this question, I ask those questions so that I can trigger a thought process in our minds. To give a justification for my presentation. The good news is, while all of that is so perplexing, the questions I ask is this. It is possible for him to be found. That's the good thing about the scripture. It is possible for the invisible God, the God who is a spirit, to be found by a man who is flesh and blood. While we worry about the confusing part, we will focus on the possibility of this scripture. This scripture is suggesting, number one, that this God can be sought. That's why he says, seek him. He won't tell you to do what cannot be done. So this God can be sought. Number two, possibility is that this God can be found. And it is the process that should now be our excitement and our joy. Through seeking, God can be found. I began to say in the morning that if you take God out of the equation of a man's existence in the economy of spirit what is left is called nothing if you remove God out of the life of a human what is left is defined in the spirit as nothing. What that means is this. That no matter what a man possesses. If he does not have God. He has nothing. 
that is the design of man. His life, his existence is futile. Is a waste minus God. So Jesus, our Lord, puts it this way. The other day when he said, without me, you can do nothing. Now, one of the meaning of that is that everything you call something that was accomplished without God in the realm of the spirit, it does not translate into value. It means nothing. We must understand that the true value of a man is the spiritual value of that man. It is possible for us to be calling some things something. But our true definition of value, because we came from the spirit, made in the image and likeness of a spirit God, our definition should come from his realm. Everything a man can do with his life, bring to pass with his life, minus God is defined in spirit's economy as nothing. In other words, a man without God has no value. Again, I made reference to the words of Jesus when he said, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? We need to be careful so that we can define value by the way God defines it. You would understand with me that the word of God is true to the extent that man have tried to survive outside of God. Man has been able to accomplish, quote and unquote, in the realm of man outside of God. There are people we attribute some values to. There are people we ascribe, we ascribe some value to based on the things they've been able to do, the things they've been able to accomplish, yet without God. Because people will hear the first statements I make and they'll begin to quickly think in their mind, but there are these atheists, these ungodly people, people who don't even believe in the existence of God that have done so much. The problem is the end of the matter. Because we have seen people that in worldly values, they seem to have accomplished much and we can ascribe so much to them. But we have also seen that most of those people have not been able to find the true definition and meaning of life. And there's still a peace that they seek that they don't know where it can be found. I was telling the first service people, how the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, who has amassed well over $200 billion, woke up last year and told himself and the world that earthly properties, houses are a distraction until Elon Musk began to sell his mansions one after the other in Los Angeles and all over the U.S. And as we speak today, the last time I read Jack Dorsey of the former uh, the Twitter guy, was talking the other day, is it Twitter or which one, whichever one, was talking the other day, he said that Elon Musk comes to Silicon Valley in California and he doesn't have where to sleep and he'll be calling friends and asking them, can I, can I crash at your place tonight? I'm in town, I don't know where to sleep. And yet he's the richest man in the world today. Something is still missing irrespective of the amount of money he has been able to amass. You will call him an achiever because he has amassed wealth. But here is a man still searching for something that he has not been able to place his hand upon. The things you would have valued, he no longer sees value in them. He has the best houses in, in, in California. He has the best houses in, around the world. But today he doesn't own any of them. He doesn't even know what he's looking for right now. Because houses no longer matter. Am I talking to somebody here? So that we can know. It is God that made man. Man's soul was not designed to be satisfied outside of God. 
So as long as he has not found God, he will still be looking for something that he will never know the definition of. He will say it is houses. He will buy houses. And after a while, like Elon Musk, he will say houses are a distraction. He will say it is clothes. He will buy clothes until a time will come. I don't know anybody who is so fashion conscious that he doesn't get to a point where he doesn't get tired of dressing. Oh, am I talking to somebody here? Am I, do I, do I, am I making sense this morning? Look at anybody you want to think about. They will dress and dress and dress and dress. This person has spent all their lives chasing fashion accessories. They will get to a point in their life that they will just become as simple as simple can be. They will start going around with, am I making sense now? That is the true meaning of life they are looking for. They have reached what you think was life. Then they found that there's still something that is life that they have not found. Unfortunately, in all their readings and in all their search, as long as they don't search the Bible, they will never go get the true meaning of what they are looking for. You can read all the books they want to read in the world. It is only the Bible that tells you that thing that is missing. There is a God void in every man and nothing can ever feel until that man finds God. There's a restlessness in the soul of man. It was created at his creation. He was created to need God. The day he says he doesn't need God, that is the day his frustration begins and it will be a journey into the abyss. That's why we hear of people, multi-millionaires waking up one day and pulling the trigger on themselves. We hear of people who are, am I making sense this morning? Yes, these are realities. Let me tap your neighbor on the shoulder, tell them, find God. That is what is missing. We have seen people at the peak of their careers. We have seen people at the top of the top. And then they are still looking for something. Today, Elon Musk doesn't think there's need to have a house. He doesn't have where to sleep. He doesn't know what he's looking for. Before he became wealthy, he thought that wealth is in the amount of houses you have. Maybe some of us are still there today. I pray that God will give you all the houses you will ever need in this world. But I'm telling you the end of the story. After you have gotten those houses, you will still be looking for something. That something is God. After you have gotten all the promotions on your job, in your career, you will still be looking for something. After you have married the most handsome man in the world and you have the most beautiful family in the world, you love your family and everything is going great for you, you will still be looking for something. After you have achieved the greatest in, the, in your career, in your chosen field and the world has reckoned with you, you will still be looking for something even after you become the president of the United States of America. You will still be looking for something. That something is God. Jesus was wise when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these other things that we just finished talking about, he said they can be added. But the priority is God. Somebody say priority. This is a case of, for priority. I'm making a case for priority. A lot of people have chased life into an empty future. I'm not saying they didn't achieve anything. Some of them got political power. They were powerful in their time. They had the respect of their contemporaries. In fact, people that were born the same time with them bowed to them. But yet at the end of the day, every man is looking for something that most men don't know the name. You may marry all the women in the world you want to marry. Solomon was a big boy in that, in that department. I'm sure you read his writings. Huh? You read his writings in Ecclesiastes? Huh? Vanity upon vanity. So if he's, so Solomon said, I gave myself to everything. I set my heart to understand knowledge. I sought all wisdom. He said, anything my heart desires, I acquired it. When it was done for women, 
He had a university of women, 1,000 students. The vice chancellor, King Solomon. You know, the question I ask myself is that even if you are to sleep with 1,000 women, one every day, it means that you have three year, almost three years uh, to, to go around. Hallelujah. When he finished all of this, he said when it was wine, and I felt like maybe the, I, I need to test the best wine. And he went after the wine. He said, I drank wine. And I drank the best of wine. And yet the best was yet to come. When you begin to pursue life, when then you will come to the realization of Solomon that the best is always yet to come. But that best, the illusion he gives you is that the best wine is still in front. The best car is still in front. The best woman is still in front. The best man is still in front. The best house is still in front. The best amount of money is still in front. And then you keep going. When you get to that front, he's still telling you it's still in front. It is frustration upon frustration. What is actually missing is God. Nothing was designed to satisfy the longing of the soul of the created man. Except God. Nothing. Your greatest discovery therefore in your mortal existence will be the discovery of your maker. How do I find him? Where do I find him? If he can be found, how and where should be your greatest worry? Because until you find him, you keep looking for a peace you will never find. You keep looking for a joy you will never find. You keep looking for a fulfillment you will never find. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you ask a young woman who is trusting God to marry, she, she believes in her heart somewhere that if she just gets a wonderful man, a nice man, a handsome man. You know, nobody wants to marry an ugly man. A handsome man. A tall man. A, a fat, no, no, whatever. You know, all of those. And if you ask her, she's, she'll tell if I can just get that, I know I will just be at rest. Dear young woman, hear ye the words of a father. Look to your left or your right. Somebody already has that man. Go and ask the person whether she's okay now. I don't know why we don't learn from history. Human beings, we keep repeating history. That thing you are looking for, that if you tell yourself, when I find, I will enter my rest. Somebody already has it, and the person is not yet resting. So what makes you think that when you find it, you have entered your rest? Somebody should tell you the truth every once in a while. The truth is, what you are looking for is God. Pastor Elijah, bless you. Look. Hallelujah. Let me tap your neighbor and say, find God to find God. Mm. That's what you're looking for. That's what you're looking for. You, you, you see, I know you may hear this message, put it on the shelf and wait. That. let me try my own when I become the governor you want to become president after that do you know how many governors want to be president now are you, are you understanding what I'm saying there is no, no end to the search that is the name of the game the devil is a master spirit he knows how to keep you in a rigma rule. So the direction of the message actually is seeking God. How? What does it mean rather to seek God? That's the first thing I want to deliver to you. I began in the first service. I said number one. The first meaning of seeking God means to turn to the Lord. If you are making notes, please write that down. The first meaning means to turn to the Lord. I didn't coin out the phrase. It's a phrase that exists in the Bible. It's in the scripture. Turn ye to me. The Lord will say, turn to the Lord. It's a Bible phrase. It has a very deep meaning. But that is the meaning of seeking God. That's the first meaning. Is to turn to the Lord. And turn is very important because 
life by itself is designed to distract man the average man i mean the the the, the, the species is distracted from god the reason god is not his priority is because he has been distracted his focus is somewhere else that's the meaning of the chase i was telling the church in the first service i stumbled upon a guy he, he, he began to chase education. Education, as far as he was concerned, maybe something told him that if I get very highly educated, I may come to a place of, of, of confidence and satisfaction and joy and fulfillment. So as at the time I was, I, I stumbled upon the guy, he had three PhDs and five masters. Three PhDs. Oh boy. In my mind, that is more than a professor, you know. Because, I mean, in 20 years, you can be a professor. I think that took him more than 20 years to have five masters and three PhDs. Highly educated. But I tell you the truth, very soon, you'll find another field you want to specialize in. Education is good. Money is good. Because it's neither good nor bad, actually. Depending on who has it. It's a neutral instrument. Am I correct? One isn't that good nor bad. It's just there. Depending on who has it. But it may be good. Everything good in life may be good. But they can never bring the satisfaction that God can bring. So, what does it mean to seek the Lord? Turn from the distraction that may be before you. Your distraction may not be my distraction. My distraction may not be your distraction. But anything that breaks your focus off of God is what we're talking about. I said in, in a deeper understanding to turn to the Lord. Number one, it means repentance. Repentance. And please, like I said in the morning, repentance is not, um, is not, is not an act that is reserved for a group of people like sinners. It's, that's not what it is. Repentance is an attitude of a consciousness of the holiness of God. That is repentance. It's beyond coming out and then confessing, I'm sorry I committed this sin. It's much more than that. It's living in an attitude and a consciousness of the holiness of Almighty God. That is far departed from our generation today because of the distractions of this world. Number two, turning to the Lord means centering on God or refocusing on God. Because every once in a while your focus will break. My focus breaks. Your focus breaks. Am I making sense here? When something else begins to occupy you more than God that makes you, you run off all the time. You are busy. You never have one moment to be with God. All your time is invested in trying to meet the targets that you set for yourself or you allow other people to set for you. Many of the targets that people have, they didn't even set for themselves. Other people set for them. If they marry, I will marry. If they born, I will born. If they buy car, I will buy car. If they grow tall, I will grow tall. What if you have a genetic shortness? Now, now, you may think that that's a bit extreme, but let me tell you why it's not extreme. Are you not noticing that people are going to do surgeries these days to adjust their shape? Because somebody was born naturally in a particular shape. Are you not seeing that people are going out of their way to change their complexion? Because somebody was born naturally with a particular complexion. So the goal is not even their goal, it's the goal somebody else set. What a frustration. When you are doing something the hard way that somebody don't do, did in an easy way. For example, somebody has been saving money for the past five years to buy a car. You were not saving money. You were buying shoes. You were buying clothes. Should I preach? Will you still like me after this preaching? You were buying jewelries. The person was foregoing some alternatives. The person was doing opportunity costs. The person was delaying gratification. 
you will enjoy yourself. The day the person buys a car, your heart did boom. So, Polinus can buy a car. Me too, I must buy. That is where corruption started in Nigeria. If they do, I must do. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying this morning? That thing that tells you that there's a particular car that will make you happy is that thing that is distracting you from God. Can I promise you one thing? There's no particular car that will make you permanently happy. After you buy that car, Toyota will do you a wickedness and bring a better one. I'm, no, you're not hearing what I'm saying. Honda will do you another wickedness and bring a more wicked car. There is no car out there that once you have, you'll be permanently happy. Nothing like that. May God help us and give us wisdom. Everything that is distracting you, that business, that money, that status you are seeking, that social accomplishment that tells you that if I get here, I'm okay. There is nothing like that. You will never get there that you are okay unless you get into God. Let me give my second point and I'll close because um, we do a marriage this morning. Let me give my second point. Give me, uh, media, give me Psalm 63. Give me from verse 1. I'll read all the way to verse 8. I'll give two points there and then we will call it a day. Oh God, thou art my God. Verse 1 says, I'm re already reading. Early will I seek thee. This is talking about seeking now. Am I correct? So we are seeking the Lord. Are we seeking the Lord? Lift your right hand and say, I'm seeking the Lord. You are not saying, you say, I'm seeking the Lord. Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsted for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, verse, 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 next verse, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Keep going. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Just keep going till verse 8. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied. My soul shall be what? Is that satisfaction that I've been talking about? This is where your soul will be satisfied. It's in him. Not in car, not in houses. Thank God for cars and houses. I'm never going to discourage you from any of those. But if it's at the expense of your God, forget them. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrows and fatness and my, my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. I wish I can preach on this verse alone. When I remember thee upon my bed and I meditate on thee in the night watches. Verse 7. Because thou hast been my help. Therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Verse 8 now. My soul followed hard after thee. Thy right hand upholded me. Let me give you my second point in what it means to seek the Lord. Number two is to desire him. To desire him. Your desire for God should supersede your desire for anything in this life. If not, you are setting yourself up for frustration. Do not say I didn't warn you. Do not say I didn't warn you. Do not say I didn't want you. Your desire for God is good to have other desires. I'm not condemning your other desires. Your desires to, to, to buy a car, to live abroad. Your desire to, to be the president of Nigeria. Hallelujah. Amen. Your desire to be the governor of your state. All of those are wonderful. But I'm saying, in the scale of preference, are you with me? Your desire for God should be over and above all. Seeking God means to desire him. The question I pose to you today. Do you desire him? Now don't be in a hurry to answer because you see. Hypocrisy is one of the sins that Jesus co condemned the most. You know a lot of Christians didn't, don't think about that. It will amaze you to know that when you study the scripture. It wasn't lie. It wasn't drunkenness. It wasn't. Um, um, what are the sins we take seriously here? Um, it wasn't fornication. It wasn't. Um, cheating. 
The sin that Jesus preached against the most is hypocrisy. Double dealing. Double dealing. Jesus was very strict with it. He was attacking it all the time. So there are questions you are asked. Don't be in a hurry to answer. If not, you just turn out to be a hypocrite. I asked that kind of question. One of such questions just now. Do you desire God right now? Again, I warn you, don't be in a hurry to answer. Because if you answer and I begin to talk, you'll find yourself to be a hypocrite. Yes. This is something you have to double check again and again. The question you have to pose to yourself every once in a while. Do I desire God today? The reason why I say you should not answer that question is because desire has a proof. If we begin to go into the proof of desire, then we repose the question. Your first answer may be wrong. Because the authentic proof of desire is pursuit. Do not say you desire something that you are not pursuing with everything. In fact, it's also important for me to let you know what your current most important desires are. They are the things that consumes your thought your mind, your strength, your, your wisdom, all your strategizing, your efforts, your labors on a daily basis. And if you put the cards on the table, there are many things you can show that takes all of that minus God. The purpose of the message is not to condemn, it's to correct and to direct. If God is not your number one desire, life is playing ball with you. Oh, people. Can I say it again? If God is not your number one desire, life is doing ball with you. You may think you are smart. You may think you, you think properly. You are okay. That's why you are doing your priorities. That's why you have the priorities you have. But one day you discover that life was just playing ball with you. Because none of those things will count under some circumstances. If you are sick today, God forbid. You understand what I'm saying? If you fall ill today, how many of you know your car may not matter again? Oh, you didn't hear what I said? It only matters for as long as you are fine, you're okay, you can just hop around everywhere. But what if? What if? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How many of you know that the moment you close your eye in death, everything you have achieved, including your, your trainings, your learnings, your certificates, your diplomas, they become nothing to you. The worst part are some of them that cannot be inherited. You know there are some things you achieve, nobody can inherit it from you. Should I name them? If you, if you go and do your ship, you spend five million naira, nobody can inherit it. Nobody can inherit your bleaching. Okay, let me leave there and come closer home. Nobody can inherit your PhD. Not even your children that answer the same thing with you. The day they are caught, you are going to go to prison with them from the grave. If your son, who is answering your name, my son answers my name. But he can't use my certificate and I can't use his because it will be illegal. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If your desire for God is not over and above your desire for anything and that is affecting your, your priorities in life, life is playing ball with you. One day you will wake up and you will tell, you will tell me thank you for this thing you told me. Life is playing ball with you. That thing that makes you to keep God on the side and face your hustle. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You face your hustle. You face your smartness. That thing is playing ball with you. He only wants to get you to a point where God can no longer be found. Then he will destroy you. That's where he wants to take you. I pray no one here will be destroyed. I thought you would say a better amen.
I thought you would say a better amen. amen. Let me hear that amen one more time. Amen. Look at your neighbor, tap them on the shoulder, tell them, desire God. Desire God. Desire God. Hallelujah. My, my prayer this morning is that as you leave the service, you would, you would rearrange your priorities. It's easy in this end time to fall into the deception and the worship of a material God instead of the God that created material world. Desire God above every other thing. Nothing should ever, if there's a clash in your desire, God should win. Nothing should ever Come close to your desire for God. Not your job, not your position, not your marriage, not your children. As wonderful as all these are, God didn't give them to you so that they can compete with him. Let me say that again. God didn't give you your children and your wonderful family so that they can compete with him in, 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 in place in your heart. One day he gave a man called Abraham a son after, after waiting. Well, of course, the man was 100 years. So I can't say after waiting for 25 years. 75 years, he had, had no child. 100 years, he got a child. God promised him at 75. 25 years of waiting, got the child. God, now, a man of that age, having a child for the first time, how many of you know that that man will love that child? You don't know. Nobody answered me, so I'm, I'm feeling sorry for myself now. How many of you know that man will love that child? You know you, he will love the child? You, if it's you, will you love the child? You will love the child with everything you got. A lot of Christians reading the Bible do not know that he got to a point where the love Abraham had for, what's the guy's name? Isaac became superior to the one he had for God. Somebody say, how do you know? Because not reading the Bible. I'll show you how I know. One day God came to Abraham in the night and said, my friend, Abraham said, yes sir. He said, I, I, I want an offering tomorrow morning. I want an offering. I want you to give me an offering. I want you to give me an offering. He said, whatever you want, sir. Anything you want. The way you bless me with this child like this, I can give you anything. And God said, you, you mean I'm? He said, I mean I'm. Anything. Just ask. It's available. He said, okay, I want your son. He said, I beg your... <laughs> what, what did... Uh, hello... He said, okay, no problem. Ishmael is, is, is there. I've been regretting that Ishmael thing. So what we'll do is... <laughs> so while the guy was processing Ishmael, Yahweh came. He said, no, your very son, the one you love, is that in your Bible? So the question now is the question of love. Watch this. Then Abraham said, fine, it's you now. I'll give him. The next day Abraham set out for the sacrifice, took the boy, took the, the servants, took the wood, took the fire, and then they were going for a sacrifice to worship on Mount Moriah. It was Isaac that was smart enough to ask the father, said, Daddy, um, you say we're going to worship, we are supposed to worship with offering, we have fire, we have wood, so where is offering? He couldn't tell the boy, now you be offering, so he said, don't worry, the Lord will provide for himself for the offering. <laughs> Because, he, I mean, a hundred year old man, you tell the boy that is a 17 year old boy, he's gone. <laughs> so he just quietly told him, he said, you see, the Lord will provide. Let's go. They got to the location. The father was building the fire. The boy was looking at the old man. Okay. He's putting wood. So what's happening? Is it dementia? The man is sick. And then the man finished arranging the wood and he said, come my son. You know I love God. I love you, but I love God. But last night I had a conversation with him. He said he wants you. God won't chop you. How do you tell your son that kind of nonsense? <laughs> Anyways, God, long story short, took the, the boy agreed somehow. Took the boy, laid him on the altar, ready for the slaughter. Took up the knife as he was bringing out the hand. The voice of the Lord came from heaven. Abraham, do the boy no harm. Of course, Yahweh doesn't take human sacrifice. Say, do the boy no harm. 
But God made a statement. He said, now I know that you love me. It was a love check. It was a love check. The test was a love check. Child of God, every day you do your business, God check your heart for love. Where your love is. He knows it. He knows it. It's not about what you say with your mouth. It's what you do. It's what you do. When the opportunity comes, we all make moves that tell God we love this thing more than him. We love our job more than him. We love our wives more than him. We love our children more than him. He wants us to love all those, but he wants us to love him more than all. He said to Simon the other day, lovest thou me more than this? That's what he said to Simon Peter. More than this, you love me more than this. You have to love God more than your job. I'm telling you, if not that job, will retire you. You have to love God more than anything. That's the reason why a lot of people are frustrated in life and don't know why they are frustrated. I seem to have all I've ever wished for. So why am I feeling this way? This is why you are feeling this way. God has not filled the void in you that was meant only for him. Nothing will fill it. Finally for this month. What does it mean? To seek God. It means to follow him. To follow him. But it's not just follow like that. Too. It's to follow him passionately. The psalmist captured it this way. In the King James Version, the 8th verse of Psalm 63. He said, my soul followeth hard. It's to follow him passionately. To follow him passionately. To follow him passionately. To follow him passionately. If you ask yourself today when none of us is, is there and you can be true to yourself without being hypocritical, how are you following the one that you call your God? Is it the same God you are going to claim that you are following passionately? The one that it was just on your way to church that your friend called you and said, ah, oh boy, Alpha, where are you there? I don't come off from house. I go church. I uh, church. I bet come, you get one match, go go watch. And you change course. Is it that God you are following? To seek him means to follow. Time will fail me to unbundle the word follow. But it means to follow him to follow him. to take steps at his command to follow his guide and his directions to follow his leading to follow the way Abraham followed God said Abraham I want you to leave your father's house he said to where sir he said I won't tell you now until you start going how many people will travel like that? How do you meet a 75 year old man in his father's house? Being in his father's house at that age is actually wrong. But anyhow, how do you meet such a man? Say, leave. To where? He said, I won't tell you now until you start going. Many times following God is like that. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to know that he knows the road. And he knows it more than you. Let me tap your neighbor say, follow God. Follow God. Follow God. Follow God. Don't just follow him. Follow him doggedly. Follow him passionately. Follow him uncompromisingly. If two way clash, the name of one is God. I will follow that one. Even if I don't know where he's going. That's what it means. Follow him. Follow God. Don't say you are seeking God if you are not following him. He said to, to Simon, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It is in your following that you are made into what he wants you to be. I'm talking this this morning because God is about to make some people here. But many of us have been distracted from following. Are you following him? Stand to your feet. God bless you. All this premature death flying around will not be your portion. 
as Christ tarries, as Christ tarries, you and me here will be around making impact. 